If it's, take, take, I'm a complete idiot, right? Let's just say, he's wrong, he's off his rocker, it's a, it's a country, it's not the red, communist, perimeter, Russian, Israel. Okay, fine, fine. Go to, go to Revelation chapter 20 and tell me something. If Gog and Magog are Russia and China and communist, if they're all that's what that is, then how can it be during a thousand year reign of Jesus on this earth, are there countries? No, there's not. Then how do you have Gog and Magog in Revelation in 20 verse 8? Come on, think. They're not countries. It's Satan. He's God. And Magog is his kingdom. That's what it is. The evidence that it's not these countries is Revelation 20 verse 8. You cannot have Gog and Magog in Revelation 20 verse 8 at the end of a thousand year reign and sit here and tell me that they mean their countries. They're not. Gog is Satan. Did you know in, in Reuben's lineage and, and, and Chronicles that Gog is a second generation child of his lineage? Why is that important to know that a, a person named Gog is in Reuben's lineage? Well, I don't know. Who is Reuben? Was he the firstborn of, of, of Jacob who was named Israel? Yes. And what did Reuben do? Defiled his father's bed. What does that mean? He slept with his, man, his, man, his maidservant, Bilhah. And what did Israel do with Satan? God said, you fornicated with her. That's why he, they're, they're the whore. They're the, they're the mother of harlots. What a coincidence. What a coincidence that the, that the tribe of Israel, the firstborn, would be the one who defiled their father's bed, who was, who was fornicating, with, he basically slept with his father's handmaiden, his, his concubine, Bilhah. And then from that, a second generation child is named Gog. And, and coincidentally, Gog is in Ezekiel 38, mentioning this animus God has toward his animus toward Gog and this Magog land of his, because Gog represents Satan, who is the one who helps Israel, who gave him the idea to fornicate. It's him who's causing them to fornicate against God. And his Magog, his land, is his kingdom. That's why they show up in Revelation only. Because that's when Satan, Gog, and Magog, his kingdom, his land, is in view. Otherwise, it doesn't even exist. It, it doesn't exist. It, it doesn't exist. So, and by the way, Ezekiel 38, go back and read again. And verse 4, And I will gather you and all your armies, we saw that in Revelation 16, did we not? He gathers them. But then he talks about also, and, and, and verse, he talks about that's going to happen in the fruition of things, but here he goes into verse 8 and says, After many days he'll, he, he will be in a state of preparation. The last of years will be his march, coming to the land which is withdrawn from the sword, the land of them who has been collected from many uh, nations or, or ethnicities, to the land of Israel, which had been made an entire desert. When he, from the nations or ethnicities, had begun his march, they will all be dwelling in peace. <laughs> dwelling in peace? Well, that's a first half issue, isn't it? When you dwell in peace, that's a definitive first half tribulation demarcation description. You are not dwelling in peace the second half. No, you ain't, Jack. You are dwelling in fear and apprehension. We just read that in Luke 21, 26. That ain't play type. You're in peace and safety, as they said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 3. Peace and safety, then sudden destruction, remember? So here they're dwelling in peace. And also in verse 11 of Ezekiel 38, And I will say, I will go up against an abject land. I will come upon them that are living at ease. Dwelling in peaceful security. Interesting. You see, this is the Gog and Magog battle number one. Because it happens when they're in peaceful prosperity under the Antichrist, under the falsehood of being so ignorant that their mystery Babylon, he's using them to usher in his kingdom. Israel has no clue. That's why Revelation 12, 17, he makes that war. But to Todd's point, it happened to the black horse when it happens. So God must have an area of a specific landmass. It does. It's going to be Asia and Europe and Africa because that's the landmass left in the second half when Satan establishes his kingdom. That's what Magog is. So ironically, those who say, Gog and Magog come from uh, countries in Europe and Asia. You're right! In that landmass sense, but there's not going to be any countries. It's going to be just Satan and his landmass under those ten kings. So there's that. Then in verse 14 of Ezekiel 38, Therefore prophesy, son of man, and say to Gog, 
Thus saith the Lord, the time my people Israel shall be what? Dwelling in peace. Three times he says it in chapter 38. They're dwelling in peace when there's a this, this destruction. Then in verse 18, it shall come to pass on that day, on the day when God shall come against the land of Israel, my wrath shall come up, saith the Lord God, my zeal and the fire indignation I have spoken. So he's talking about different movements because there's a dwelling in peace clearly, but here it's different because there's a war he does come against Israel and dwelling in peace. And we know that doesn't end well for them. And we don't see God's fire there. Because he's, he's, he's telling you all three things in this chapter about, again, telling you that he tells you that he's gathering them in chapter 38, verse 4, which is the end of tribulation. Then he goes back into telling you when they're dwelling in peace is when you're going to be making a war against them, which is the first battle. The second battle he alludes to with that verse 4 issue, gathering them together. And then he talks about this in verse 18, which is the other aspect of when he says that my, my, my indignation will be against them. That's the second battle. He's letting them know that first battle, just so you're going to win it, and you take my people out when they're dwelling in safety, I, I'm going to, I, I taught from the very beginning in verse 4, I'm going to gather you when it's all said and done, and you're going to have your up and comings. Which he does talk about that in Revelation 16. Remember? Remember your phase is dried up, he takes the false prophet, and, and, and the beast, and, and say, the dragon, come on, he got, come on, come on. He's bam! I mean, he, he tells you he's doing that in chapter 38, verse 4. He's doing that in Revelation 16. He told you that. So it's like, wow. But then you go to chapter 39, and he talks about this, this second battle. He goes into that second battle. He alludes to it a little bit, chapter 38. But he clearly talks about dwelling in peace when that's going to be made the case when it comes against Israel. That's the first battle when he wins. That's the midpoint. And there's a second battle at the end of tribulation. And this is where he says in verse chapter 39, verse 2, I will assemble you and lead you a cause to come to the farthest north. We talked about that in verse 38. I will destroy you and your bow from your left hand and your arrows. Because now he has arrows. Because remember, we just read about it. He has a bow with no arrows as the white horse. How does he have arrows now? Because he gave him authority in Revelation 6, verse 8, as what? The pale horse. The opponent. That's at the end. So he's demarcating the difference here. You've got to pay attention to these little nuances. And then in chapter 39, he also talks about in verse 6, I will indeed send a fire against God. Well now, ooh, like he did in chapter 38, he alludes to the second battle with talking about the first one. Chapter 39, he's talking about the second battle, but he's alluding to the final battle, which is when Revelation 20, verse 8 and 9, he brings down fire from heaven. You see? You see how he's doing this? He's alluding that there's more than one. You have to pay attention to these little nuances. And then, in verse 11, he goes back to the reality of the second battle where he's going to come back in Armageddon and pummel him. And on that day, I will give God a noted place, a burying place in Israel, the graveyard of the strangers by the seashore. And then, verse 13, during the seven months, the people of the land will be employed burying them and shall be them a memorable epoch to be called the valley that was glorified, say the Lord. When he was glorified, says the Lord. Then they will send many men to verse in the land to bury them who are left on the face of the ground in order to purify it for se after seven months. This is part of the Armageddon piece of it. This is what the Jewish people are going to be doing out of Petra. They're going to be taking these people and carrying these dead carcasses from battle number two. And verse 15, everyone who traverses the land which sees a human bone will set a mark upon it until the barriers bury it and hide the, the graveyard of Gog. For the name of that city was called the graveyard, which is Hemengog, Hem the valley of Hemengog. Thus saith the land, so thus, thus shall the land be cleansed. And that's what he's talking about. So I hope you understand for the first time that hope that makes some sense to you. By the way, the word Gog has a etymology you can you can extrapolate that it means rooftop, which has this idea that he's over all. Right? That's Satan. He is, Gog is Satan, just so we're clear on it. Again, I'll say it ten times from Sunday. Gog is Satan. Okay? So just so you're clear. Gog is Satan. Gog equals Satan. And Magog equals his kingdom. What Satan's kingdom? I don't want to say his kingdom. I want you to be clear what I mean. Satan's kingdom. No. Which is established. Which is which is established in the second half. Because in the first half, it's just a mystery. Established in the second half of tribulation, which is why Gog and Magog don't happen until tribulation is already at the midpoint. So all these people say, oh, it's happening now. Tushrin, tribulation. No, it is not. Because that's Satan. You don't know who he is. He comes under guise of, of deception and all that stuff. He's not going to, oh, I'm here, I'm here, the devil. He's not doing that until he already sucks you in like an idiot. 
That's what he does. No, in, in Revelation 20, when it talks about uh, the Gog and Magog, yeah. so it, does it become that before the people rebel and become as the sand of the sea? Does it have to be Europe, Asia, and Africa, apparently at that point, no, I'm just no, no, no. The whole earth has been the whole earth's been renovated at this point. You got you got the whole land masses back. The reason he says Gog and Magog, he's pointing out that here comes Satan again, Gog, trying to establish his kingdom, which is Magog. He's trying to establish his kingdom again by these people that are following him, coming against the camp of the saints. And Jesus says, no, it's, poof, it's fire coming down. That's what he's talking. So there's no literal. I'm just I was making a, a jest about the fact that if you want to say Magog is the land of Satan, and since he's overseeing Africa and Europe and Australia and Asia during the second half tribulation, and those countries of these communist people reside there, okay, fine. But that's not even relevant at that point. Russia and China won't even exist as we know today in that point in that time. There's not, there's not going to be any there's not going to be any person in China running China and in Russia running Russia during the second half. No, there's not. There's going to be ten kings running the show. And they don't give a dog on who you think you are. I don't care if you're Putin or whoever you think that other guy with whatever the guy has given his name right now. I, Zhao. You can't even whatever the person I can't remember their names all the young Kim and, and Korea. It doesn't matter. It, all that stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in the second half. They're all gonna be irrelevant. Like he cares. Like Satan cares. Oh you're Putin, I'm gonna use you. He doesn't care. He doesn't need him. He's Satan he's already revealed himself as Satan declaratively. People are drying dying from stress and fear. Why would he need Russia and China to put fear in your heart? Well, he, so, doesn't, he doesn't need them. I, I thought the Ten Kings were going by the second half. They, they, are, they are, but they quit. They're, they're, they are, quickly. But they're there at the beginning, then they, they go away quickly. Okay. They're there at the very beginning, then they go away quickly. Because remember, they give their kingdom of the beast for one hour. So they're there for a time for one hour. So they're, they're there for a very short period. To your point, second half tribulation, they're there for a short time. And then they're done away with which speaks to the fact that there's not going to be any need for any rulers or countries to even be relevantly referenced in the second half. They're going to be non-existent. It's all going to be one kingdom of Satan. Again, from the, from the throne of the dragon in Jerusalem and throne of the beast in Babylon. There's no need for any countries or deliberation of leaders. None of that exists. It's just going to be that. That's it. So, so in other words, by the time the black horse is off the scene, they're off the scene too. Correct. Okay. Correct. The time the black horse is out of the way in 90 days, they're gone too. That's exactly right. So... So, Brother Todd, I don't know if I answered your question, but I hope I did, because that's the difference between Gog and Magog. Gog's a person, Satan, and Magog is his landmass or his kingdom being established. And that's why you don't see it coming into functioning into view until Israel's thinking of dwelling in peace and safety. Think about that. For all those people that want to tell you prophecy conferences, that Gog and Magog are, are Russia and China and Afghanistan and North Korea coming against America, coming against Israel. Oh, really? When does Israel think they're at peace. How can they dwell at peace? What an asinine, ignorant thing to say. You cannot, oh my gosh, how do you not know that Israel is not going to ever dwell at peace until tribulation? That's the first time they're going to have a peace. False peace as it is. But they will be. And then it says, after they have this false peace, then Gog and Meg, then Gog strikes. What a coincidence. You see what I'm saying? So those who go, oh, it's this and this and this, how can it be? There's no dwelling in peace in Israel. Come on, man. But they, but they sell books and fill seats with conference of all this sensationalism because that's what they want to do. We read the newspaper and it's like, whatever, man. Say what you want to say. Gog is Satan and Magog is his kingdom. It's that simple. So now, the last question that, and that God made it funny, by the way, I love it, when you said, um, and yet now you understand why I wanted to review every week for the past hundred weeks. <laughs> this is true. Then you have then you have Brother Lee's question. Brother Lee's question. Last one. Hello. Last but not least, I almost dropped my book, my Bible on the floor. Last but not least, Brother Lee has a question, and that question is on Revelation 7, verse 9. Well, actually, no, not last but not least, Brother Todd and Brother Lee. Sorry, my apologies. Brother Todd's got a question, then then Brother Lee. Sorry about that. I'm doing order how I receive them. So Brother Todd's got one more question here. It's in Revelation 7, verse 9. I got confused because they both had a question about the same, the same verse. So, Brother Todd, really, okay, they have, same, they, have, they have the same verse, but different questions. So Brother Todd says, okay, I want to know about Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. Break down 
the, the nations, the tongues, the tribes, the peoples. So Revelation 7, verse 9, and it says, After these things I saw and behold a great crowd, which no one could have numbered out of every nation. Now, remember, the average person in Christianity is going to read the first part of Revelation chapter 7, and this is where I agree with you. That's talking about Israel, the first chapter 7, verses 1 to 8. I agree. There's no problem with that. Well, there are clearly 12 tribes and 12,000 from each tribe. I agree. 100%. No questions asked. Got it. 100% agree. So what's the problem? Because verse 9 is not the same group of people. I don't know how you can say that it is when you clearly can see God telling you it ain't. Pardon my bad English. It's not. Right? How about, well, how do I know that? Because did he say? Let me see. And behold, a great crowd which no one could have numbered out of every tribe. Out of every nation, ethnicity, out of every tribe, people, and language. Why are you saying that if, in fact, you're still talking about the 12 tribes of Israel? I'm just asking for a friend. God, since when do you refer to Israel this way? They're tribes to you, and you always made it clear to us it's what they are. So why are you now calling them uh, nations and tribes and people and language? They What? 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 Because it's not the same people in view. It's not, right? But folks, when I say, well, chapter 7, it starts off with the 12,000 from these 12 tribes, and therefore the whole chapter refers to Israel. No, it does not. Sorry. Sorry, it just doesn't. It just doesn't. And by the way, I want to, this bears to mention one quick excerpt. This part, indulge me for a little bit here. So if you go to Isaiah, I want to show folks how God, not me, I'm just an idiot, how God teaches. Not me, how God teaches. So how God teaches us, not me, how God teaches us. Isaiah 61, if you read Isaiah 61, and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me, to put, publish glad tidings to the poor, Isaiah 61, verse 1, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim deliverance to the captives, recover sight to the blind, and proclaim an acceptable year of the Lord, and a day of retribution and judgment. Okay, so my question is, just asking for a friend, why is it that when Jesus was quoting that verse, he did not complete the verse? Speaking of which, there are no chapters and verses. We made that stuff up. He opened the scroll up and he stopped in the middle of the thought. And you say, well, prove it. Easy. Go to Luke in chapter 4 and you'll see it. And in Luke in chapter 4, Jesus is speaking. In Luke chapter 4, he goes into Nazareth on the Sabbath day in verse 16. And in verse 17, no one hands him a book. He, they, they entered the Sabbath, the, the synagogue, he stood up and he read. And the book of Isaiah, the prophet, was given to him. He gave, he gave, him, he gave him the book. No one told him where to read from. I said that backwards. They gave the book of Isaiah. No one said where to read from. It's a scroll for crying out loud. He opens it up and he reads what we call today Isaiah 61. And he reads, watch how Jesus reads. It's interesting. Having unrolled the scroll, he went to that spot but toward the end of the scroll. He reads it. And he goes, oh, by the way, uh, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim glad tidings to the poor, send me to publish to release the captives, cover the sight of the blind, dispense freedom to the oppressed, to proclaim an era of acceptance of the Lord. Wait, 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 wait. Jesus, you mean you're not done yet? You didn't say in the day of judgment. You didn't say that that judgment part. Well, well, why didn't you say that? And he says in verse 20, he rolled it up, gave it back to the attendant. The eyes of all of them were attentively fixed on him going, what, what, why did he read from there? And he goes, this is why, verse 21. Uh, yeah, in this day, what I just read to you is fulfilled in your ears. They're like, he's saying he's the, yeah, you got it. But more importantly, they also should have asked, the, right away, if I was a Jewish person, Paying attention, I would say, um, why didn't you say the last part of that, retribution, judgment part? Why did you leave that part off? Right there, he would have said, because that's how I teach. I, <laughs> I fulfill scripture in the way I deem fit, not the way you think. And I will fulfill a part here, and I won't even finish the thought. What I mean, what I mean not, 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 not only will I fulfill scripture partially, as I please, I will even speak it partially as I please, even though I wrote it to you fluidly, I am teaching you a lesson. Pay attention. Don't think what you think. Think how I, I want you to think, Jesus is telling us. And we continuously don't care. 
we all, well, well, Revelation 7 says Jewish people, therefore it's always Jewish people. He's not going to change his mindset. He just showed you the first time he taught the synagogue crying out loud, he didn't finish the whole verse. How's that not teach you a lesson? That he's not doing what you think he should do. So pay attention. You know, it's so like, come on. It's so exciting and yet frustrating. It's exciting that he teaches us this, but it's frustrating when we ignore it and act like, I don't know why you're saying that. Because Jesus tells you that's how he teaches. I didn't, I didn't do that. He did that. Now, yeah. It's a shame Judas didn't pay attention there. That would have... I know, right? Well, he wasn't he wasn't with them at that point. He came a little bit later, to, the, to your point. Yeah. He wasn't with them probably then. I, I mean, I'm much my guess. i got to go back and verify the timeline there. But you go back to Revelation again, and, and the question, Revelation 7, verse 9. So what are the, the, the nation? The ethni- nation means ethnicity, or ethnos means ethnicity. Tribes is, is phelon, which means a tribe. So the nation's ethnicity speaks to Gentiles. The tribe, or phelon, speaks to Israel. All of Israelites. And, the, and the, the word peoples is leon. It means pe- it's used in the Bible to speak of people, a generalization of people of all classes. Whether you're wealthy or poor, whether you're a woman or a man, whether we're part of the world you're from, all people. People is a more general term that's not specific to Jew or Gentile. It's specific to whatever class of person you are. Male or female, white, black, or gown, forgot to write it down. He don't care. All peoples, of all classes, of what they look like, their social, their cultural, it doesn't matter. And then he goes into languages, which is the word glosson, their dialect, which speaks to basically all that diversity of their, their, or their heritage, where they're from, their country, right? So what he's bringing out is that people that are part of this uh, 144,000 that are going to be mentioned in chapter 7, verse 9, this is the, this is the soon Medicoid people. And that's why they're, they're made up of Jew and Gentile, of different classes of people from different countries. That's what he's saying. He's just saying to you, don't give me this garbage that the, the Scandinavian people have the market on the bride of Christ or folks from Africa have the market on it or people in North America. No, 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 no. There's a diversity of Jew and Gentile, of different classes of people, male, female, a social structure and cultural structure and different countries, they all comprise this 144,000, which is also of the Sumeticoi, that is, and it's also going to be commensurate to what the bride itself it looks like, just a diverse, diverse group. And so that's Brother Todd's question. Then Brother Lee's question is, hey, wait a second here. What's the timeline here there before the throne, though? So in verse 9, when he says, and he has, and there, no, one could, no one could have numbered them, every nation, and again, ethnos and tribe and people and language, standing before the throne and the presence of the Lamb, invested with white robes and palm branches in their hands. And they cried a loud voice, saying salvation to that God of ours who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Huh. And it says, and all the angels stood around the throne and the, four, and the, and the elders and the living ones, and they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying amen. So Brother Lee's question is, hey, wait a second. So they're before the throne before there's even an Ariston. There's even a Dipnon yet. There's, there's, not, there's not even a wedding feast yet. They're before the throne. How can that be? What's going on, right? It's a great question. So this speaks to, just so you know, this speaks to the people that are in heaven now, right? We die, leaving Christ to go to heaven, right? So we talked before about how there's a place that from those who had the captivity held captive are the, the have-not section, and those Jesus gave gifts to men to, based on Ephesians chapter 4, are going to be given to the more blessed side, Right? So there are folks within that piece that, again, are of the bride of Christ. And they're not known as who they are yet. They're going to be, they're going to be revealed as being the betrothed bride when, they, when the judgment seat comes. You're going to know who the bride is at that point. He's going to say, this is my betrothed bride. And then later on, she'll be the revealed bride later on at the Dicon. But the reality is that you have this whole process of this people's, or this soon medical 144, they represent those in that fourth wave that have come out. This is a this is a triptych of fast forwarding to what's going to happen at that wave of wave four when they're on Mount Zion. Then they go up to meet him in the air. That they're before the throne saying this because they're with the other folks that are part of the commensurate faithful ones, called out ones and called ones. They're the ones coming back with him, and that's where they're stationed. It's just kind of showing you their proximity is closer to that throne, and that's why there it says they're before the throne and the presence of the lamb invested in white robes and palm branches in their hands. 
that goes back to, again, to remind you, to remind you of Revelation 19. And by the way, let's go back, I don't want to forget. When you go back to this um, uh, phrasing here in Revelation 9, 7, 9, for if I go back, back and forth just a bit, but in Revelation 7, 9, it's, so he's, they're, in, they're in robes, the white robes, and with palm branches, which is the royalty in their hands, right? So then you fast forward into Revelation 19 and verse 7 and 8, when you see here, when he says, uh, Behold, that, wait, sorry, rejoice, excuse me, exalt and give glory to him, uh, because the lamb, marriage of the Lamb came and his wife prepared herself. And it, it was given her, given, she didn't earn it, God gave her the ability, that she should be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. And this is the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints, right? And so we saw before, this is the, this is the lamp prawn, white shining light, Whereas over here, it's uh, a Lucas. Uh, that's the word for white back in Revelation uh, 7, 9. If you look at your word robe and the word white is Lucas, which has that word like Lampus, Lucas is in there. So you have this similar process being brought up that again, it represents those people. Mount Zion, he's fast. Remember, chapter 7 is not in consecutive order. Remember, he's talking about 12,000 being sealed to 12 tribes. Does that happen at the beginning of tribulation? No. It happens at the beginning. And by the way, when do they know that there are 12,000 and 12 tribes? They don't know to the end of tribulation when they come out of Petra and God then reveals to them. They're like, oh my gosh, that's pretty wild. So that whole understanding has to be known that in chapter 7 is God just letting you know what I'm telling you. I'm letting, I'm letting two groups of people here, those of covenant, those in testament. I have two groups, 144. I got my hand on them. And I'm going to protect both of them. One, I'm going to steal in Petra, my people of covenant and the others in Testament that I've given mysteries to that I'm going to make them grow overnight to this 100, full, 100 fruit yield. I'm going to get them to that point. They don't even know who they are. I'm going to just, as you call it, deputize them. They're going to just go, whew. And then all of a sudden, these people will then be on the Mount Zion. And from there, they're going to be exalted up to this point. And they're going to see before the throne. They'll be seeing God, the Father. It's going to be it's amazing, which is speaking to the position of the bridal chamber people. So even though they're not the bride yet, this is like the prelude to them being revealed. This is kind of like that whole aspect of, again, those you have and have not. There's those who have been given gifts to men and those who are bringing captivity captive. This is clearly they've been given gifts to men. They're, this is a gift. This is a privilege to them. So I hope that answers your question, Brother Lee, because you're right. There is no Ariston yet, and yet they're before the throne. It's speaking to a fast-forwarding of what is in, is in store for these people 144 soon medical at the end of tribulation when they meet on Mount Zion they get taken up and they come back so that's what happens hope that makes sense so oh wait a minute why did you mention 144,000 for verse 9 because because that's who's in view so to your point so <clears throat> because that's who's in view for the rest of the chapter why did you mention 144,000 and you said it's a different group of people. Because of because again in verse nine it's tribe, nation, people, and language. It's not Jewish. If you continue to read the chapter, they're the ones who come out of great affliction in verse fourteen. And you read the rest of the remember the, the verse in verse sixteen, they will hunger no more, they will have thirst no more, the sun will not fall on them anymore, speaking to the Revelation sixteen, the the the, the let me see, the fourth uh, bowl was the sun being poured out, burst of flames onto the earth. That's not fun. So they were enduring that, but n no more. In verse 17, because the lamb which is in the midst of the throne will tend them and lead them by fountains of water, commensurate to Revelation 21, 4. He'll lead them by every tear out of their eyes. He'll, he'll, he'll wipe every tear out of their eyes. This is commensurate with the bride. So we talked about that before, but this is the 144,000 Sumedicoi people from verse 9 to 17. Verse 1 to 8, 144,000 Jewish. Verse 9 to 17, 144,000 Sumedical. Earmarked by chapter 7, verse 9. Verse 9 tells you it cannot and is not Jewish people at that point anymore. It's not. It's not. They're not, they're not ethnicities, tribes, people's languages. No, they're tribes. That's it. When he starts involving ethnicities and tribes and people, that's, that's people in Christ. Specifically, he tells you they don't know who the people are. That's the soon medical people. Yes. Now, let me, Paul was a type of the soon medical. He had three years with the Lord. 
Now, these two medicoy at the beginning of the tribulation, might they have some kind of uh, discourse with the 60 and the 30, knowledge-wise, in the first half of the tribulation, heading them for their deputization? I, yeah, I think so. You're asking where people on the first half that are mature ones left behind for waves two and three have conversations and be aided in helping these two medicoy who become that in the second half. Is that what you're asking? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I think so, yes. I think absolutely so. I think they're going to have definite ties to those people's conversations. I think that's probably where they get some of this kind of things. They get they get kind of sterezoed. They're getting established by those people. Then God just kind of firms them up and then takes them off. I think that's how that's going to work, personally. I think those 30 and 60 are kind of like establishing them, as Paul calls it, confirming them, establishing them, sterezo. He's, they're firming them up. And then all of a sudden, he's going, God's going, okay, now, you're, now it's time to start bearing some fruit, and I'm going to help you just accelerate this. And he's going to accelerate that. That's going to be just the Holy Spirit doing that with them. So that's what that's going to be. I think so. God, Todd's good. So we're all good. So that's that's all the questions I have. We went over again. I apologize, but I want to make sure I finished. So with that being said, next week will be Communion Sunday, but we'll also cover chapters eight and nine next week. So remember, it does not mean chapters one through seven are exempt. Anything we already talked about, chapters one to seven, is still in view. But we're adding on chapters eight and nine for review. So we're going to keep going through the review through as we continue to do this. And I love, I love <laughs> Brother Todd's funnyism when you said, this is why I wanted to review every week for 100 weeks, and yet here we are still asking questions for clarity, which is, is good. It's fine. We have to go through this. So I want, the whole point, remember, is to get this in our minds, in our souls, to just not just say, oh, I studied Revelation, that we can actually re 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 retort back to people what we studied. You can actually have notes to go back to, and you can have your own understanding of what it is instead of just... Because I, I can't tell you, folks, I've said, hey, we took a year and a half, they asked me, what are you studying right now? It's all from Revelation. And then they say, oh, I studied that, da 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 And I say, hey, what did you guys say about this? And they, I don't know. You see, I can't tell you how many times they, they've told me, I've heard of very, very few, if any, who can remember when it comes to these, like, um, questionable verses or uh, uh, objective understandings of things, they totally have no clue. They just go, I don't, I don't know. But I don't remember. Or I, I don't, he said something like this, or... He said, what about, what about you said? What, about, what, do you, what do you understand God's saying to you? And it's, that's why we're doing this, to make sure we really give it to heart and understand it. So hope it's been helpful. We continue to do this. So again, next week will be also Q&A on Friday. Don't forget, this Friday's Q&A coming up. Next Friday's Q&A. Sunday coming up is Communion Sunday, along with chapters 8 and 9. So with that being said, we'll close in prayer. So Father, thank you for this, uh, this time and opportunity we have to always be with you. Thank you for um, sharing your insight with us and your wisdom and, and understanding. Help us to learn and grow and always see your hand in, in all that you do in our lives and open up this word to us that we can take it in and treasure it and always make sure that we put the spiritual matters, even though it's so hard to do, above the temporal, earthly, worldly things that consume us and, and, and demand our attention. We know they're important, things of relationships, things of finance, things of responsibilities, but help us understand what governs our practical, pragmatic needs is our rooted foundation we need to have on who you are and what your word has to say. And when we have that rooted foundation, let that govern how we think and live and, and how we should then apply the pragmatic, practical solutions to our roles and responsibilities. So thank you so much for having us be occupied until you come and doing the things you'd want us to be doing. So we find us to be faithful, Father, until you, until you come back and take us home. We ask this in Jesus' Yeshua's name. Amen.